August 10th, 2021 meeting of the Carlton School District Board of Directors is called to order. Um, Michelle, I don't know if you've done this before. Would you be willing to leave us in the Secretary, please call the roll. Director Frank. Here. Director Hunter. He is not here at this moment. Director Scholar. Oh, there's George. Nope. George is just walking in. Perfect timing. Director Hunshar, you can say here. <laughs> here. Oh, here. <laughs> <laughs> Director O'Brien. Here. Director Mendoza. She's not able to be here tonight. Director Apple. Here. Director Zaletsky. Here. Director Simsik. She is not able to be here tonight. Director Shriver. Here. So there's a time at the beginning of each meeting where we invite the public to comment on any agenda item. So is there anybody in the audience that would like to comment on an item on our agenda tonight? Seeing no interest, we'll turn to Dr. Crager for your comments on the finance report. Very good. Thank you, Director Shriver. Uh, we do have, we have, uh, Two brief reports this evening. We'll have a superintendent's report. We'll also have a uh, finance report as well. So I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Fieldby. He'll start off with the uh, finance report. Thank you, Dr. Kreider. Tonight, I don't really have a formal presentation for you. I know it's going to really break a lot of people's hearts, but you've listened to me a lot in the last couple of meetings. But um, I do want to take this time just to discuss a couple of items that you're going to see new on the, the agenda next week. And um, open up any questions or concerns about the items that I'm going to put on there. Uh, I want to introduce first um, a new financial report that I've used in the past. Um, I gave you each a copy of this sort of financial report. Um, I believe that this report would give you, as a board, a better picture of the monthly uh, financial status of the, the district. Um, this report is going to replace the Treasury report, which is effective, but it was a little bit tricky to understand, and it didn't always include um, the different funds like the food service fund or the activity funds. So it wasn't always a complete picture of all of the accounts that we have, where when we go through this report, I'll show you um, where we have that. Um, the numbers you know, in each of the, you know, the Treasury report and this report are, are going to be relatively the same, so there's not going to be any difference. There's no, it's, going to be, um, it's actually going to be more transparent because these reports are coming straight from our ProSoft um, software. So let's um, go through the thing. As you see on the cover, August is our board meeting for this month. What, what it's always going to be is the financials are always going to be one month prior. And um, what we do is we use only our um, reconciled accounts so that we make sure that everything that is on there reported is what has been reconciled through the bank and through our um, software. So on the first page you see it's our treasurer's report of cash and cash equivalents for the month ended of July 20, or 2021. The first section of it basically is all of our checking accounts that we have in the district. You're going to see your beginning balance which was the ending balance of course in, in the end of June. Um, Throughout the month, you're going to see under the receipt, that's all the money, the revenue that has come in, the transfers that has been happened between accounts. And then you also have the disbursements, which gives us our ending balance as of the end of July of 2021. So if you're looking at this right here, our liquid amount of cash in our checking accounts is $2.7 million. The investments, on the other hand, that's, it's the same format. You have your beginning balance, which is the ending balance in June of 2021. Money that we received, money we dispersed, and our ending balance. So, so this is going to give us our total grand amount of every single account that we have. So unlike um, with the, um, the treasurer's report of the previous, the treasurer's report, because the athletics fund 
and the activities fund and the food service fund are not actually in our software, which we're in the process of moving it into our software as we speak. Uh, this is now going to allow you to see exactly what we have that is um, available to us, what's liquid. And you know, we, as you see here, we have $8.7 million in our banks, but not all of it is available readily. You know, we have money in our activity, we have money in our food service, and you know, there's different areas. So that's the first part of this report. The second part of the report is the actual expenditures and revenues that come out of the system throughout the, the month. So if you look at the first page, the first one shows us the revenue accounts for the month. What, what we show in the first column is our anticipated revenue, so that's basically our budget. The second column will be the adjustments. Adjustments will be any budget transfers that I bring to you throughout the year and will be reflected on there. You will not see any adjustments until October when we're legally allowed to make adjustments to that. On the next column, the third column is the year-to-date revenue. So that will keep a running total, so you'll always be able to see where we are for the whole year um, as far as the revenues received. The next column is the current revenue. So that is the actual revenue that was received in the month of July. So it gives you a, a picture of just so you can actually see, compare that, okay, of the amount that we received so far for the year, this is how much was received actually in the current um, month. And then the remaining balance. On the second page of that revenue account, if you look at the very bottom, that is our report total. So this is a lot like the reports that I put up on the uh, screen for you where I say, okay, this is how much um, we're budgeted, this is how much we've used, this is how much is remaining to be collected. So as you see um, on here, you have your budget of the 30 million 879 revenues received was 2 million for the year so far and we have 28 million to collect so you're always going to be able to, to look at this really quickly and say okay we're at six percent of our collection which is common because we were only one month into the fiscal year the next set of um, reports are the expenditure accounts and all the, every account from both the um, revenues and the expenditures I went with major object and um, major functions so that you can see you know, with instruction, these are the, the, the um, different categories that we have that in exactly the same way. We have the original budget, the adjustments, the adjusted budget, and then year-to-date expended, and then current expend, uh, encumbrances. Current encumbrances are our POs that we have out there. The current encumbrances are also another one of those items that is not always reflected on the treasurer's report. Uh, there's, um, as you see, if you look at the last page of this, we already have committed $295,000 to um, purchase orders you know, for expenditures that are coming upcoming throughout the year. So this is going to allow you to always see a true number of how much our expenditures have been. Without that encumbrances um, being reported, you're going to think year to date we've only spent $838,000, but really you have to add another $300,000 on. So I, I think it's another important tool to have to, so that you can you know, see you know, where we are in a true standing at that point of the month of where we are. And with, as far as the year to date on this one, it doesn't give you a monthly um, expenditure um, listing, but the year to date expenditure is as of the end of July or at the end of whatever that month is of this report. So those are the main um, revenue and expenditure reports that are on this report for you. And then we also will include in here the athletic fund report and the activities fund report. So basically what we're, we're doing is we're, we're condensing down a lot of the, the motions which Director Shriver should make you happy. You know, I think we're going to have, this is going to replace three of the motions that you would normally have to read. So this is just basically, um, it's a, an all-in-one. It'll be in the, um, the motions every month. And it's, um, I just, I believe it's something that is a little bit easier to understand. It gives you a little 
clear picture of you know where we are, what we've spent, and I think it's important too to see you know what money do we have where in the accounts. So that's what I have for that part. Is there any questions on this report? And is it something that you're happy with and you'll pay to move in with? I'm sure we'll all digest it over time, but mm -hmm. at, a, at a high level, having everything in one place and being as transparent as you are here is a good thing. So. Right. And, and this is something that, um, as I do my monthly reports, yep. I will reiterate a lot of the information that's in here that will help you to grow and learn as you know you go through to see exactly how the money is moving. And eventually, you're gonna you will start seeing trends and how things flow the way that we see them flow. So, okay, that's that part. And the, the next topic that I wanted to cover. Uh, Keith, I have a question. Oh, sorry. What's the reason in our subscribing to two different banks? Subscribe to PNC. Oh, the, PNC the PNC Bank was the bank that we were currently, or we were previously with, that um, Mr. Judswick, prior to I, myself coming, switched over to Dollar Bank because PNC. They used to be the preferred bank for a lot of schools because they didn't charge a lot of fees. They um, gave us really good rates. But over the last couple of years, PNC stopped giving um, uh, interest on our checking accounts when we you were under. We have with Pathfinder also. Right, and they, all, they also started charging us all kinds of fees for everything. And it was, it was really, it was a move that needed to be made. Um, other districts that I've been at, we've switched out of PNC just for that same reason. So that's why you see the dollar or the PNC. I have, um, I think the general fund is the only one that has any balance in it. I have everything moved out of there with except for, I believe our Heartland POS system, the money that the parents go on and pay for the kids' lunches. We're having trouble getting a hold of them to get them to stop putting money into PNC. So, you know, it could be a case where I could, it, you know, the fees are starting to outweigh the, you know, the amount of money coming in. I might just have to um, switch it to Dollar Bank and just close out the, you know, PNC, and then they'll get notification and they'll call us. But I, I, I have to weigh that out because I don't want to make anything Thanks call or anything. So that's why. Okay. Um, any other questions on the first financials? All right, the, the second topic is um, I'm going to have a resolution on the um, board next month or next uh, week that's going to ask you to pass, uh, or to ask you to pass to enter into a relationship with the Pennsylvania Local Government Investment Trust, or Pliget. Pliget is a, a bank. Just like our P's Laugh account uh, bank, it's a uh, wholly owned bank that's run by districts throughout the um, Commonwealth. Um, the Commonwealth invests into this bank, and, and basically, what um, the, the biggest benefit for us with this play, I mean, it's basically twofold why I want to do this, is with the interest rates right now the way they are, they're just not rebounding and we're not getting the interest rates. I want to have another avenue to be able to invest our money. So what I, I this will give me the ability to do is to to work through the, the dollar, the play it, and the peas lap to find what is the best rate and just do our transfers. Since transfers do not cost us anything, wires or anything, it's, it's not very hard at all to, to transfer money back and forth. So if I can use um, the three banks against each other to, to maximize our revenue, it's, it's going to benefit the district. So that's, that's the first reason why I, I want to use that. The second reason is I'd like to begin a procurement card program. And you know, if you're not familiar with that, the procurement card program is basically having a company credit card. Um, the only difference between the credit card and the procurement card is with the procurement card, there's no lines of credit. We are required to pay off the balance at the end of every month. Um, management sets the transaction um, daily limits, the um, one-time you know, transaction limits, the also um, the monthly limits. So we can set however we want to set it. So you know, if um, I got Dr. Kreider a card and said, that his limit is $200 for each transaction, he can only go up to $200 or his card will deny. 
and we do the same thing so that it compounds. So if he spent 200 here, then we only say there was $1,000 for the month. Once he hits that $1,000 through those single transactions, he is not able to um, use his card at that time. So that, that's one of the, the advantages of having um, a procurement card like that. And the other one is that we can also control what a person can get, what they can buy. Um, it's through what's the MCC codes, and, and I'm trying to figure out what MCC is. Like the only thing I could think is that maybe it's a merchant control code. Um, basically, what it, it says is that it allows us to go through this list. There's four or five pages of things that says, you know, from everything from buying groceries to gas to um, entertainment to whatever. And we can say, based on whatever position and, you know, whatever card we hand out. So if I'm giving it to, um, let's say maintenance, I'll say, okay, the, they have authorization to use it for hardware stores, um, depart, you know, different department stores, anything that has to do with tools, utilities, or anything like that. If they try to go to a casino, or they try to go to, you know, the athletic director goes out to um, take the kids out to the States and they all wanna go to Hershey Park, you can't use it there. So it's really, it's really limited on what can be used. So it has um, a lot of controls in it. And also this procurement card um, has, through Playgit, um, they have a protection on it that if we have five or more cards, we are covered through insurance of $100,000 per card for any misuse, um, theft, or um, just any, any kind of um, things that would happen. A lot of cards that we've had in the past for PNC um, did not have, did not offer that. You have to buy that separately. So that was one of the, the benefits of this um, program here. But the primary benefit of the strategy is that the more you use the card, the, the bigger rebate we get. Up, we receive a rebate from them. So there's there's different tiers of um, amounts that you spend, and what it basically comes down to is that. If, if you can go from one dollar up to a million dollars, or if you, you know, I, I can't see us going higher than that. It, it would go fast if we start paying utilities and different um, some of those big spending, like our, our um, supplies and different things like that. You you get a higher level each thing, so, and I believe that if you hit that million dollar level, it's ten basis points which is approximately uh, $25,000 that they write you a check just for using this card. So that's, that's one of the, um, the, the benefits of it. And it's also, it's gonna be a time and cost saving thing for um, the check writing of our account payable person. Because there's a lot of accounts that we, we are very small, that, especially with maintenance. You know, they'll, they'll go out and buy a bolt and then we have to write a check for a dollar so. So, so that saves them time. And another thing that is good is that each person that has a card has to um, reconcile that account at the end of every month. And they actually code that um, to the actual accounts that are in our post-off system. So it talks to our post-off system. And then once they reconcile their account, and if they don't reconcile it, it keeps giving them reminders over and over again. It comes to me, I approve it, I hit upload, it's all thrown right into the um, system. There's nothing else we have to do. It's a really such a good time saver. So um, that, that is a, a really a, a, a plus when it, you know, we're as busy as you know, we are in the business office and you know, having the staff that we have. So basically, the process is it's about a four to five week process to get this program started. Um, part of this process is that we will take a look at the um, board policy 625, I believe it is, which is the procurement card one, to make sure that you know we have all the limitations that you know we'll discuss with you as the board of you know what limitations, who do you want to have cards, how many do you want, you know, do we want to start out slow with just a couple cards just to get the system rolling, do we want to. You know, we don't want to have too many. That's that's the key that we can't control it. Um, but right, what I was thinking right now is that you know if we look at possibly having one for each of the schools, you know, one for my office, maintenance, technology, possibly um, special ed as a start, and then um, you know we can see how the program goes. And what will happen is that. Um, 
you're gonna you'll have to approve all of you know the um, the users. So we'll we'll come to you and say, okay, these are the users that we have. And then what I'll do is every month, as part of this report, I'll add on a procurement card report. So you'll see the usage of the card. And the one good thing about the card, it doesn't cost any money. And if it comes to the point where it becomes a, an issue or a problem, that it, we can stop it at any time with no penalty. So um, that's basically what I have today. Um, you know, so if you have any questions about the procurement cards, about anything else, um, finances. Keith, the, the initials PLG. PLGIT, Pennsylvania Local Government Investment Trust. It's a very, very common group. A lot of, a lot of districts we use Plugit funds to, to manage money. And the Plugit is, um, they just actually went through um, a buyout where Bank of America is going to be back in right now. So it, it has the cloud behind it. Uh, before it was a PFM management group uh, based out of Chicago, but now they've actually gone bigger <coughs> with Bank of America. So it, it's a it's a really they, they offer very good um, rates to especially to districts and and one another one of the positive things that um, you know, I don't like to keep bringing up my past, but. Um, what they do is, and it's free to the, the school district, is they'll, they'll take our bank statements every month and they'll put it into a, a, a spreadsheet and then they'll go through a whole year, put it together, and they'll see our, our trends of how our money is coming in, how our money is going out. And at that point, they'll say, okay, you have available approximately, especially at the beginning of the year when you have a lot of tax revenue coming in, they say, you, might, you have available $3 million that you really can you know, invest here are some of our options that we have, and they, they list it for you, and then you you it kind of it really it's, it sanitizes you because you see it right there that okay I can put this money into here, and just in one year of doing this and at um, Moon School District where I was, I was able to increase the uh, revenue. Uh, I was probably I think we went from twenty. $30,000 up to $120,000 just through the creative um, investing of money and you invest throughout the whole year and that's where a lot of um, times you worry about investing later in the year if, you, if you're not really good with your trends of how the money's going but there's opportunities throughout the year and you know this is one thing that is a benefit that they offer to the districts that Peace Laugh, um, they used to do that but they recently um, laid off their regional manager, our regional manager. So we really have nobody to um, to, to contact with there. And, and I, I wish I, I remembered the name. The, the Plague um, regional manager, she's actually from Crafton. So she's she works out of Harrisburg, but she's a, a Crafton lady. And, um, you know, that, that's going to be even more about it. It'll be easier for us to, to get a hold of her if we have any issues or problems. So that's um, that's my report. Questions? We're good. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Kubi. Thank you. Greatly appreciate it. I think the, uh, the overall uh, updated monthly report, um, as you mentioned, it, it does provide a lot more transparency, a lot more information to the board, uh, a lot more information to the public as far as the current status of our finances. So. Um, I think it's a, a great move as far as the update with that report. Um, just to bring the board and the community up to, up to speed on our health and safety plan, um, the landscape continues to change in regard to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, much of our health and safety plan, the premise that we have written into that plan, takes into consideration all of the elements that um, recommendations and guidance that is provided to us by the Pennsylvania Department of Health, uh, PDE, Allegheny County Department of Health, and also the CDC. Um, so I wanted to provide a little bit of information as far as some updates that have, that have come from, mainly from the CDC, um, and in some recent conversations with the Allegheny County Health Department. Um, Allegheny County Health Department supports um, 
in its entirety as far as what the CDC has come out uh, with their guidance. Last year, as you recall, as far as uh, Pennsylvania Department of Education and the Department of Health, they provided us with additional guidance that went uh, beyond what the CDC provided. They took that information, interpreted it, and, and put it out to school districts and uh, had some mandates, some guidance and requirements were, that were put in place. Um, this year, as far as their statement coming out, it, they're not going to come out with any additional guidance. What they ask the schools to do is to take into consideration uh, what the CDC has put out in regard to guidance for, for schools. Um, July 9th, which was prior to our, our last meeting, CDC did come out with uh, some updated guidance. We shared some of that information. Uh, one of the pieces that I did not share at that time was just the updated guidance on identifying close contacts and then how that has an impact in the schoolhouse itself. Um, so close contacts in the past have normally been defined as uh, six feet, within six feet of another person who is uh, infected with the COVID-19 virus for uh, cumulative 15 minutes of time throughout a 24-hour period, period of, the, of the day. So in the schoolhouse, translated into, um, if I'm sitting next to Director Shriver here for uh, 10 minutes and then I leave and I don't see him again throughout the rest of the day, if he's positive, we would not be considered to be a close contact. But if we sit here for 10 minutes, I leave and I have another class with him and I sit next to him for another 10 minutes, now that cumulative time has surpassed that 15 minutes, it would now make me a close contact to, to a positive individual. Um, so that's the, the interpretation that they had. It was within a, within a six feet um, distance. The update that they came out with in uh, their July guidance uh, indicated that that six feet guidance is still in effect for the general population, but in the schoolhouse, it moves to a three foot distance. So now if I scoop my chair out right now, we're one, two, we're very close to three feet distance right now. Um, that three foot distance, if we're beyond that, it would not, would not apply as a, as a close contact. Um, additionally, they came out with the guidance that for students only in the schoolhouse, not adults or any other individuals uh, throughout, if students are fully masked uh, during their interactions with each other, uh, then they are not considered to be close contacts. Um, so that I think is important information to, to recognize as far as masking goes. Last month when we came out with our health and safety plan at the elementary level, children being uh, required to mask, uh, the chances then of a child having to quarantine based on being masked at our elementary level would be very, very limited, uh, even if they had exposure to another child who was infected with COVID-19. Even if we're three feet apart, we're fully masked, um, that child does not have to quarantine along with any other child in the, in the classroom, uh, provided that they are um, fully masked. Um, contact tracing pretty much remains the same, as you recall, as far as our con contact tracing efforts last year. Um, our teachers kept very detailed seating charts in regard to what students were present, where they were seating. Um, if a child was, was positive, school nurse went up to that teacher, checked their seating chart, checked the attendance rates, actually measured distance between chairs to identify whether the person was within six feet of them. And then uh, we would reach out to Allegheny County Health Department with our information, share that with them um, to help with the uh, quarantining uh, guidelines. After we got the hang of it, we were pretty good at identifying who needed to quarantine. Um, we'd start the quarantining uh, messages and phone calls home to parents uh, and in the process would also notify Allegheny County just to keep them up to speed on uh, what the exposure was. Um, so that close contact, um, it still has some exceptions in place. Uh, so for example, if you uh, were in an unmasked environment, uh, if you are fully vaccinated, um, then up to using the guidance from Allegheny County Health Department would determine whether or not you would need to quarantine. And then also in addition, if uh, you were infected with COVID-19 within the past three months, that would also carry a little bit of protection in regard to uh, the need to, to quarantine as well. So there are some, some minor changes and updates from uh, how we interpreted uh, close contacts and how we had to go through the quarantine process uh, from last year. So those were the updates that I didn't necessarily mention in last month's presentation. Since last month's presentation, August 5, CDC came out with uh, additional updates. 
I think those are the ones that really started to hit the, the news more. Uh, you started to see some uh, additional businesses, corporations, Giant Eagle, University of Pittsburgh, Penn State, uh, coming out with masking requirements based on that updated guidance from the CDC on, on August the 5th. Um, with that, the CDC cited with the increasing rise in cases, um, with the, the transmission rates across the United States, the number of counties that are either in the, in the high or substantial rate um, has grown significantly over the past few weeks. Uh, they're contributing that much to the, to the Delta variant, um, which is spreading faster, um, not necessarily as um, lethal as what the, uh, the original virus had with it, uh, although they are starting to recognize, I think we all start to recognize that we're seeing more people who have been vaccinated uh, who are being diagnosed then with, with COVID as far as testing positive for it. Um, what the science has to say about that, I, I don't really know because the science is so split on a lot of different issues. Um, so in addition to that, as far as indoor masking, um, when we passed our last health and safety plan, it, it had the recommendation for unvaccinated individuals in the K through 12 environment that they uh, unvaccinated recommended that individuals wear masks. Uh, now they are coming out, whether you're vaccinated or not in the K through 12 setting, is that all individuals, uh, including staff members, uh, should be in a, in a masked, uh, mass setting. Um, other agency updates uh, that we received since the, the last health and safety plan that was, that was passed. Um, in our health and safety plan, we mentioned that we were partnering with Allegheny County to conduct antigen testing with our staff and students in the schoolhouse. We had two of our uh, certified school nurses go through and receive training from Allegheny County. I believe it was in April of, of this past year. Uh, so that they could go through and administer antigen tests to, to students. Um, unfortunately, Allegheny County reached out to us and let us know that they are not going to continue to support that antigen testing uh, program, that, which would have been provided free of charge to all of our staff, all of our students. Uh, we could give as many you know, COVID tests as we wanted to or needed to, uh, but they're not going to support it. The rationale that they gave for that is that the federal government um, in coordination with uh, states, including Pennsylvania, are going to come up with their own individual testing programs. Um, the Department of Health in Pennsylvania and PDE have not come out with any information um, specifically as to how to access those testing kits and how to, how to incorporate them, um, but it does indicate that they will have on-site assistance and those kind of things, which I think is pretty tremendous as far as being able to accomplish and send people out to, to schools to, to assist, but we'll see how that um, plays out. So we will we'll take a look at what the state has to offer in regard to antigen testing. If it is available, uh, we'll reach out to them and, and do our best to, to get involved uh, with the antigen testing. So uh, my report more or less uh, just has some of those updates, the piece that I did not include about the contact tracing and the close contacts from uh, earlier in July and then just the updates from uh, August 5th from the CDC regarding uh, masking requirements, not requirements, but uh, the recommendations, and tying that back into um, the basis of what we, we built our, our health and safety plan is, is really using that guidance from the CDC, um, which is what we've, we've been asked to do from the state and the uh, American Rescue Plan. So the board has any questions in regard to information that, that I've received or any of the information that I've read about, please. I have a question. Go ahead, Jude. Yeah, I've got a question. So, um, you know, last year there were, at least once if not twice, we had to close um, some of the schools temporarily because of the number of positive cases within X amount of time, right? That's correct. What, what are the conditions for this coming semester um, how many cases, how many positive cases does it take for us to have to shut down one of the schools and for how long? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Last year, um, we had uh, signed on with the state that we had to commit to uh, following their recommendations. And if uh, those recommendations included thresholds based on the size of a school district, I think it was less than 500, it was a small school between five and a thousand was a a medium size and above a thousand was a was a large school. Uh, 
Um, this year, the state has not put in any uh, guidance or mandates as far as school closures. So our plan going into to this year, if we would have a significant spike in a building, uh, we haven't really defined that term significant, what that would look like. Um, that component, what we plan to do is work very closely with Allegheny County to take a look at what are the local conditions as far as what is the transmission rates in Kraft and Carnegie and Roslyn Farms uh, that would substantiate us to move towards a short-term closure. Um, but they haven't put any thresholds in place to say last year it was between three and five cases that you they recommended that you close down for uh, up to three days. And like you had mentioned, Jude, there were some times we closed, I believe it was Kraft, and I don't think we ever had to close Carnegie uh, or the high school. Technically, we did close some buildings um, over the weekend uh, just to go through uh, and reset our, our numbers because they worked off of a 14-day window, and that helped keep our, our buildings open in the process. Okay, so there's no top-down. There's nothing to find yet, but that's, that's something we still need to work out. Correct. There's not correct. There's nothing from the state that would be that be something we would have to to uh, leverage at the local level. Thank you. You're welcome, John. I have a question. So that I could picture what's happening in a classroom. Each of these tiles is a foot. Correct. Okay. So I'm sitting here, a, a fidgety child. So is the next child at three feet or past three feet? If my briefcase is three feet away from me. Mm -hmm. I, in, in most of our elementaries, at, at least at, at Carnegie, uh, last year we were a good, we were a solid four feet, I think, in, in every classroom. So there's no question I, the kid is moving around. The, the, tightest, the tightest place I saw were some of the classrooms here in this building, um, some of our science classrooms. It was a, it was a very close, it, it was not less than three feet, but if we look at where Director Shriver and I are, I'm at one, two, we're, we're at three feet right now. Okay. Um, we might be a little bit more than three technically. And that's measuring. But really there's not three feet between. Not between. between. So as far so as that's, that. You don't count that three feet. They didn't really put in measuring guidelines. Okay. Uh, the way I interpreted it was from to be fair and even and equitable is center of chair to center of chair. Nice. That I think is the okay. easy thing. You Thanks. know. Um, but um, yeah. Very solid spacing at our elementary levels, and then in addition to that, with the uh, the plexiglass that we had installed uh, during lunch periods when students were in an unmasked environment um, last year, uh, Allegheny County perceived those to be determined as walls, so that you were actually separated by a wall if you were behind the plexiglass between one person. Thank you. Any other board questions, Kelly? So John, just from my perspective. So what you outlined is that we gave our guidance a couple of weeks ago. It was consistent with national recommendations, although things have changed and, and their recommendations have evolved. Now you're seeing new recommendations that might be more stringent than what our health and safety policy is. So we'll have to continue to monitor that as time goes on and as more information becomes available. <coughs> That's correct. Yeah, I agree. And I think as we've seen over the past year, the guidance that comes out from the CDC has been very fluid. It, it changes, and this particular case changed within a matter of three weeks. Um, listening to Allegheny County with their projections as far as where cases are, um, they're still putting their updates out three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, every 48 hours, and then 72 hours over the weekend. They're noticing uh, case numbers of slightly over 100 per day. They are noticing uh, more cases of, of children in hospitals. Um, they forecast that the curve will continue to go up. Um, they did not expect this number of cases to hit in the summer. They did expect it to hit uh, potentially in the fall, um, but they do see eventually that the, the curve will eventually go down uh, on this strand, just like it has with the other ones. Um, but again, they, they, they don't have a crystal ball either. No. But just to be clear, our health and safety plan that we adopted in June was consistent with the CDC guidance at that time, but as it stands, it is not consistent with the current CDC guidance. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. And to be clear, this current CDC guidance is more restrictive. Correct. Correct. Okay. 
Right, and especially around the, the hot topic, as everybody knows, is, is wearing of the masks, and that's that's the hot topic that um, pushes a lot of buttons, and, and it, it, it's something that, that we see, and um, I think we we recognized both sides, and we've listened to it. Um, in the end, we do need to make a decision, um, and. As I said before, we're the referee in a basketball game, and you make the call, and half the half the crowd's going to cheer, and the other half's going to boo. Um, and it's, it's just it, it's unfortunate, but uh, I, I think what uh, what really pressures this is is that we're talking about the safety and well-being of our of our students and our staff. Um, the one thing that the Allegheny County mentioned this past week on on the phone call that we had with them uh, was that they're they're still not sure of the long-term effects. Um, you know, there's a lot of the talk out there that you know the symptoms it's a, it's a common cold um, but they were pretty vehement against that as far as not knowing what the what the long-term effects are of, of COVID um, and just the same with with the argument with the vaccine nobody really knows everything with with the vaccine and what what could potentially be the, the long-term effects of of getting a vaccine either it's an emergency certified uh, vaccine which is I think Moderna was was looking to get theirs FDA approved very soon um, just based on the number of case studies that they had out there to be an FDA approved vaccine. Pfizer is anticipated is to be approved in three weeks. Mm -hmm. Pfizer, okay. Three weeks. Okay. And I mean, just to be clear, one of the big differences between last year and this year is kids who were quarantined last year could go home and could live stream into their classrooms. So this year, students are not going to be able to live stream into their classrooms. I mean, we have the Cyber Academy as an option. So if our primary goal as the school board is to keep kids in person because we know without a doubt that is what they need is in-person schooling. We need to put as many layers in process in, in place that we possibly can to enable that to happen on a consistent basis because when these kids get quarantined, because this is so much more contagious, because the Delta variant has a higher <coughs> load, we're going to have more kids being quarantined in at home. And that's not good for anyone. So, <coughs> so. I mean, that's my philosophy as a board member. If we are going to be looking at this again, we need kids to be in person, and we need to do what we can to keep them in person. And if that means the inconvenience of wearing a mask for some period of time, they're in person. And that's the better educational product. Plus, school districts right now, I mean, I don't know if you're watching, but I presume you are. The districts now are flip flopping, and those there are a number of districts that voted optional no masking that are now saying masking across the board two of which large districts did it last night so mount lebanon masking box chapel masking k-12 everybody in the building so if our basis is that we need to follow the cdc guidance i don't think we should be picking and choosing aspects of the cdc guidance to follow so. i'm curious when does montour when is their school board meeting meeting? Yeah. I don't know. Because they're the only school district that has an absolute complaint, right? No, there are others. There are others. Yeah. The further but away you get from in our area here. Yeah, okay. I don't. Well, I mean, you know, from my standpoint, what other districts do or don't do is kind of, you can look at it like, well, why did they make their decision and can that inform my decision? Personally, my decision is based on what goes on in our three communities. And like Leanne said, you know, the overriding goal is to provide a safe learning environment for students and staff, but also to keep people in person as long as we can. And so um, I, th I thought, you know, whenever we passed the, uh, the, the health and safety plan last time, um, and we, we said, Look, if things change, our our, you know, our our decision could change, and um, you know, I I wish things weren't trending the way they are, but it seems to me that you know we uh, we're in a, in a trending towards a more dangerous uh, environment, and um, you know, I agree. I think that we need to consider. Reconsider what, what our original decision was. So I look forward to that, that discussion. Well, and as you mentioned, the, the review process.
process, we are we're required by the American Rescue Plan to review the plan at minimum every six months, um, which, like I said before, that's something that we will we'll definitely hit that target um, as far as review. If there's nothing else there, I'll move on to the personnel section of our, of our meeting. Uh, turning back to the board, there's four items under Section 3 Personnel. I'll entertain a motion to approve the following items. Number one, to accept the letter of resignation from Varsity Head Girls Basketball Coach Mark Heil, effective immediately. Number two, to approve and award a temporary employee contract to Abby If as a special education teacher at the junior senior high school, effective August 23rd, 2021, consistent with the terms of the CFT collective bargaining unit agreement. Number three, to award the position of long-term secondary science substitute teacher to Greg Petronsky, effective August 23rd, 2021, and consistent with the terms of the CFT collective bargaining unit agreement. And number four, to approve and accept the resignation of secondary French teacher Billy Veslovsky, effective immediately, and I'm sorry, there is a fifth item, my apologies. Number five, to approve Rena Taylor as special education clerk, effective August 16th, 2021, per the terms of the SCA collective bargaining unit agreement. Got a motion for those five items. So moved. Second. Move second, any discussion? If not, we'll vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay? Aye. Thank you. Uh, motion carries. Thank you. Um, under section four, old business. Does any director have any old business they would like to bring up tonight? I'll bring up one quick thing. We uh, we talked about having a facility study to help us prepare for spending our uh, stimulus money. John, do you want to give us a quick update on what you're thinking? I know there are a lot of moving parts to the district right now, so are you thinking of keeping that sometime in the near term, or are you thinking of pushing it out a little bit? Uh, as far as the facility? Current committee part? Yes. yes. Um, Mr. McDay just gave us an update on uh, this week as far as all of the accomplishments that, that he's had done as far as facility improvements over the past couple months, uh, which we've had, we've been able to make some headway. We do have some larger projects that are out there. We have the craft and window project, um, that uh, the information we started to get back from the architects looking at um, the infrastructure components of, of the windows moving into the terracotta that it may be a little bit more than what we had originally anticipated just simply being the, uh, the windows themselves. Uh, the, win the screen project at, uh, at Carnegie is scheduled, still has not been completed. Um, some of the issues that we're running into um, Mr. McDade is just uh, supplies that uh, some of our yeah, <clears throat> just procurement of um, whether it's just the supplies themselves or uh, the transportation component of, of getting those supplies out to, to places is, is a little bit of a struggle. Uh, but, but what we do want to do, uh, we do have some larger projects that are still on the list, uh, one being the, the roof here at the high school. So we do want to uh, move through, assemble um, a committee to take a look at, at our facilities uh, to put together a comprehensive plan on how, how to move forward with uh, the ESSER funding and the and the ARP funding as well, um, which we know it, it's a substantial amount of money. But we're we're very fortunate through <coughs> ESSERs and the American Rescue Plan to have uh, I believe it's close to five million dollars total that has a um, lot of specific details on how that can be spent. Um, as far as the uh, HVAC at uh, Crafton Elementary, that, that's on schedule. Uh, we will have uh, all new uh, piping, all new. Uh, ventilation units in there, all new air conditioning components to it. The cassettes um, in each of the each of the areas will be completed. Um, most likely to be until maybe the second week of, of school, until the third floor and the uh, main office area is completely done. However, we will continue to have fresh air moving through the building. At that time, some of the places won't be completely conditioned air, uh, but it will be filtered and, and, and safe. Um, but uh, yeah, getting assembling a, a committee together to, to take a look overall overall facilities is something we want to move forward with, um, and I think we, we do want to do that sooner as opposed to to later. So, if there's any board members that have an interest in serving in that 
committee can let John know. Yeah, and along those lines, it, it, uh, Mr. Schreiber and I had, had talked also just as far as different types of committees um, to, to start to, to take a look at as you know, potentially an education committee, a buildings and grounds committee, and then a finance committee um, so that we can start to uh, dig a little bit deeper into some of the uh, decisions that we make, uh, better sharing of information to make better decisions and um, those kind of things so it's a little more comprehensive. So we will look at expanding committee type of work. At the present time we have the finance committee, normally would is scheduled on the first or the second Tuesday of every month. Um, potentially if we, if we do an expansion of committees, it may have an impact on the flow of, of how we run the finance committee meetings. Uh, they may be replaced with an educational or, or buildings and ground type of committee uh, type of work as well. Uh, John, on these committees, are they open to people outside of the school board tax rates? They would be open to board members to, to serve, but then you would still have public meetings where you share the information. Um, but generally, you don't you don't have um, um, community members serve on, on the committee itself. It's more of a board related in, in district. But then having an open dialogue in public about the status of that committee and the updates. Community members could serve on uh, parent community advisor committee, and I think Dr. Kreider is interested in setting one of those up later this year. So that's good. Okay, so um, on a somewhat related item, I've noticed the, uh, the work in crafting work the property that we have. That we partnered with uh, the borough and Alpasan to um, you know, have their stormwater storage, but also a parking lot. Mm -hmm. Any um, communication from those folks as to progress? Or? They they kept the schedule. They made a lot of progress uh, yeah. early on in, in the summer months, and that was their, their goal was to make sure that uh, the digging up of, of the street was completed prior to the start of school, so it would not have an impact on, on traffic outside of Crafton. Um, they are in the middle of that now, for sure. Yes. <laughs> well, for sure. The parts we hear about is the end. Yeah, they're yeah, but they are getting towards the end. Now. Yeah, it's yeah. been a few weeks that they've been digging up at least three or four weeks where they've been yeah. digging up. So um, they're on, on target for that. The target for the completion then of the uh, of the parking lot on top of the, the water basement uh, job there is, is for the spring of 22 to have that completed. Um, at that point, they're looking to uh, work collectively with the city of Pittsburgh to re-image the Crafton Boulevard there, looking at some, some bump outs, some landscaping along both sides. Because um, as you know, one side of the street is, is Crafton, the other side is the city of Pittsburgh. Um, so I think it, right down the middle of the street is, is actually owned by, by both entities as far as control. So um, there'll be a lot of cooperative type of work between Crafton Borough and the city of Pittsburgh in order to get some um, permits and, and those types of things before they're able to move forward. Um, but as they move forward with their, their bump outs and their uh, landscape <coughs> issues, I know Mr. McDade has been taking a look at the, the landscaping so that um, if we change the landscaping out in front of Crafton, we want it to have a nice curb appeal with everything else that's going in on, on that street as well that moves forward. So um, we've made some, some improvements to the, to the front of that building, um, but as far as the landscaping goes, we'll take a look and, and make sure that it, it aligns to be a little bit more aesthetic. Thanks. Any other old business from the director? About new business, any new business? I have a question. Uh, John or Dennis, does it look like we'll have sufficient number of bus drivers? As far as I know, I know that uh, Monarch is, they're advertising for drivers. Um, however, they have not indicated to us, Monarch, they cover many different school districts, many. Uh, they have not indicated to us that they're going to have a, a shortage of individuals to, to drive our buses. But surely they will tell us. They would ahead of time. Yes, they would. Dennis, you have you have not heard. I, of I, I spoke to Scott today. He didn't say nothing to me today. And Mrs. Smith, we, I think you have a little bit of community yes, insight. Yes. Yes. <laughs> we have our meeting on Monday, and the bids will go out on Monday, and everybody will bid, and we will know for sure who's coming back, who's not, who's going to pay what run. So everything's still up in the air for us as well. But Monday, Scott will have a clearer picture for you. So when you run those bids, you have the opportunity to bid on whether you take a 
a Crafton route or whether you take a West Allegheny route? Um, because of the way our contract reads with you, we will have to fulfill your contract before we go anywhere else. So the Crafton runs will get bid out first and they will have to be fulfilled before we take city runs. Okay. And I would assume there's, there's probably a fight at the front of the, the bid line to get Carlington buses, correct? <laughs> No. 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 City runs pay more. <laughs> but the children. <laughs> At least one of the children. <laughs> so, but yeah, your runs will get covered. Thank you. Any other new business instructors? If not, open forum. Anyone in the audience have any open forum questions? Mr. Smith. Uh, questions and a couple questions. First is, is that, um, that's not the treasury report, but the finance report, is that going to be uh, publicly available? Yes. Where is it going to be publicly available at? It'll be on the board agenda as where the treasury report always was. Okay. So you'll be able to see it. Via board docs? It'll be board yep. docs. Yep. Okay. Um, question, did the schedules for the students get sent out yet? They have not, not at the high school. We're not, at, at the high school level, we will mail out seventh grade schedules seventh graders new to the building will have a hard copy um, at the for grades 8 through 12 they'll get an email indicating that they can log on to power school and access their their schedules electronically um, do you have to know how do you have, to have like a goal date for when it's going to get set out two days ago did okay. you get it no uh, <laughs> um, I'm always a huge component of, of, of getting the master schedule done as early in the summer as possible. Um, they're still going through and, and doing a few little changes right now, but I think they're on schedule for at least a solid, a solid week before school starts to have schedules available, if not sooner. We're, we're two, three weeks out right now, but um, I, I so, think they'll have them next So is, is the goal always to get it out like a week before school starts? Because like, it, it's always come out like a week or less before school starts, but we always run to the impression that everyone was running late to the schedule. Is it always the goal to come out like a week before school starts? In many cases, actually, yes, to have it come out. Many schools will do it as late in the summer as possible because there's, there's a lot of components to the master schedule mm -hmm. that go through yeah. and you build it. If I send you your schedule in June and you look at it, then you have all summer to go, hmm, psychology or this class and then people go, they go through many different iterations and then they talk to their friends and they find out who took this type then it just creates a big line at, at the counseling office to go through and then there's a lot of schedule changes so there's also a lot of parameters in, in schools that they put into place look once you get your schedule this is it the only time we're going to change it is if it has to do with graduation requirements or any other types of major issues scheduling conflicts things like that um, so are, are there are a lot of schools that delay it a little bit. They may have them done in the beginning of the summer, but then push it off till the end. Uh, well, well, the reason I ask is because I know every year everyone gets their schedule. Everyone goes, oh, wow, they messed up like three of my classes. Everyone calls into the guidance counselors. Then um, Mr. Canty and Ms. Barnes have like only one week to change everyone's. Just tweak yeah. it a little bit here and there. And I know you spend a whole week trying to call. You can't always get a hold of them because of just how many kids are doing it. So, you know. My goal for here for the high school, and it has been this past year, these, you know, this past year was really the first iteration of going through with uh, the master schedule me being here. It's still, I think, unique with the COVID situation and just mm -hmm. time being taken aside with, with those issues. Um, what I would like to see in the future is that the schedules are, many of the master schedule run iterations where we let the computer do a lot of the work are done the first or second week in May. So students can actually see a tentative schedule that they have, and then it has the opportunity for the students while you're here in the building to go make an appointment with your counselor during lunch hours, have them available during that time to go through and make minor changes to a schedule. Um, and then at that time have the, the summer time to go through and, and do some refinements to the schedule. Um, after Keystone exams and PSSA scores come come back out, there's mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, some yeah, opportunities after that, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I okay. So, I prefer more of an accelerated approach. Okay, so that means like been accustomed to. Yes. Like so, like in the future, then instead of like how we sit down at the end of the year and then we get like the pink, like the pink papers that have a like, courses and they tell you like to select every single course 
because we're not only really going to be able to get you one, you'll actually be able to like see sort of how we're getting fit up and get like a preliminary thing. Yeah. Okay, that sounds great. Yeah. Power school should should be a big help, especially as people become more proficient in it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other open forum questions? If not, we'll turn to the board. Any last minute open forum questions from the board? If not, you'll have to act for Marisa. <laughs> any uh, any motions? To adjourn. So motion moved. to adjourn. <laughs> All right. Wait, wait a second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Aye. Thank you. We are adjourned.